Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about the new OpenAI API, which is essentially ChatGPT accessed via an API endpoint. And it's extremely exciting, not only because it opens up the power of ChatGPT to engineers to build amazing applications on top of, but the key differentiator is a 90% price reduction that they were able to achieve with their new API called Turbo. It's essentially exactly the same as DaVinci, but at 90% less cost. And this really sets up OpenAI to be the leader, the platform of the future of AI applications. And if you believe in AI as much as I do, it's really gonna set OpenAI up to be the next internet or the next mobile, essentially a platform that powers the next generation of technology. I am super excited. In this video, I'm going to give a walkthrough of the new API. We're going to talk about the different functionality it has, how to use it, how to get set up. Stick around to the end because we're going to build the tutorial application using Python. All right, so this is the blog post announcing the ChatGPT API and Whisper API. So the ChatGPT API is essentially an API the same as you're using with ChatGPT's chat interface. So you submit a prompt. It provides the completion for that prompt. It provides the most likely response of what it thinks would complete your prompt. The Whisper API is a voice transcription service. And from the videos I've watched and some other people testing it out, it works incredibly well as compared to a lot of other transcription services out there, even including uh, YouTube's transcription service, which is supposed to be quite good. And so first paragraph, they talk about what they are, the 90% cost reduction, which I think a lot of people are sleeping on that, how important, how truly revolutionary that is. So, and so we'll see what the future holds with that price reduction. And so they've given a few examples of early users of ChatGPT and the Whisper API. Snap, the creators of Snapchat are a very early user of this and they've built built a friendly customizable chatbot, which users can use. They offer recommendations. You can have it do other things. So they give the example of writing a haiku for friends. Quizlet is another early partner who used uh, the ChatGPT API to build something called QChat, which is an adaptive, fully AI tutor for languages. And then Instacart is another one. So basically having a AI assistant within the Instacart app where you can ask it, you know, things like what should I have for lunch and what are some affordable lunch options? And that's all going to translate into actually buying groceries through Instacart. And it looks like Shopify, one of my favorite companies, is also getting in on the fun. They use ChatGPT to actually power the Shopify's assistant, their shopping assistant. So it says here, when shoppers search for products, the shopping assistant makes personalized recommendations based on their requests. Shop's new AI-powered shopping assistant will streamline in-app shopping by scanning millions of products to quickly find what buyers are looking for or help them discover something new. Very cool. Again, the main innovation of the new API is how inexpensive it is, which we can see here, 0.002 per 1,000 tokens. And, and I'll talk about what a token is shortly, but it says 10x cheaper than our existing GPT 3.5 models. So let's dive into the API. We'll start at the introduction. What it talks about first is that something quite unique about the OpenAI API is that it can be applied to virtually any task. So a single API endpoint, which is the completions endpoint, can handle so many different use cases, whereas a lot of other NLP services, you're going to have specific endpoints, different tasks that you want to accomplish. So maybe there's one endpoint for translation and another endpoint for creating chatbots. But really what was revolutionary about ChatGPT in particular is the fact that it's a single entry point. It's a single endpoint that you can ping with any prompt and it's going to get you a, a smart response back. And so they talk about the completions endpoint here. The example they give is write a tagline for an ice cream shop and the return will be, we serve up smiles with every scoop. It also talks about designing the prompt, which is what prompt engineering is, a really new field. And a lot of people are going to get into it, I'm sure. So next I wanna talk about a really important concept to understand, which is tokens. So tokens are not only the base unit of understanding of OpenAI's models, but it's also how they determine how much your prompt should be charged, how what the cost is of the prompt and the response as well. The API defines a token as roughly four characters or three-fourths of an English word. And the total 
prompt plus response needs to be less than 2048 tokens, which is roughly about 1500 words. So remember, very important to remember, it's not only the prompt that has to be within that limit, but it's the prompt and the response. So it's important to try to keep your prompt short so that if you do need a longer response, you can get it. So here's a few examples. Tokens can be words or just chunks of characters. So for example, the word hamburger gets broken up into tokens ham, burr, and ger. But a shorter common word like pair is a single token. And they also provide a tokenizer tool so you can actually see how many tokens a specific prompt is going to be. So let's test this out. Tell me something cool. So this is five tokens, 23 characters. Tell me, and remember spaces are included, something cool, period. Five tokens, 23 characters. So if you wanna get a sense of how much everything is gonna cost, this is a great tool to use. And I'll link this in the description. And so even though the main endpoint is gonna be the completions endpoint, they do have a few models to use. And so let's explore those. So some of the models are GPT 3.5, which is their main model. This is what Turbo is based on DaVinci and ChatGPT. They have Dolly, which is text to image generation and very, very cool stuff. I have a bunch of videos about AI generative art, which you can find right here. They have the Whisper model, which is the audio to text transcription service. And again, I mentioned it works really well. They have the embeddings. They have the embeddings model, which is a way of finding how related two different words or two different phrases are. This is really good for search. So if you're you know, typing in a search term, you want it to provide back the most relevant results, which is really what the embeddings endpoint or the embeddings model should do. They have the codex model, which is specific to generating code from natural language. And they have the moderation model, which is trained on identifying sensitive or illegal content. And then they have GPT-3, which is the slightly older version of the main GPT-3.5 model. So let's go through the quick start now. They provide a few examples. So with this one, it suggests one name for a horse. I'll click go and it provides lightning, which is fine. And then the next one is being more specific. Suggest one name for a black horse, midnight. Great. Here's another one. But what I want to get to is a setting called temperature. This is not a required setting. This is optional. Temperature is one of the most important settings, although it is optional. And you're basically telling the model how unique or adventurous you want the response to be, where zero is really respond exactly how the prompt is telling you and don't have a lot of variance in your responses. And one is saying, be as adventurous as you want, provide really cool, unique responses. And so you can set that value anywhere between zero and one, and you'll get different results. Let's test that out. In this example, it says, suggest three names for an animal that is a superhero. And we actually use few shot prompts uh, so we provide a few examples and we're going to set the temperature to zero and let's see what it outputs. Super Stallion, Mighty Mare, and the Magnificent Equine. Let's do it again. So it provides the same thing. And again, the same thing. And the reason for that is because the temperature is, is zero. So it doesn't provide any room for creativity. Now, if we turn it up and we'll go halfway, 0.5, do it again, we get some new responses. Steed of Justice, Equine Avenger, and Mighty Mare. And we'll click it again, and we actually get different responses. And most likely each time we do it now, we're gonna get different responses. If we turn it up all the way, now we're gonna get really creative responses each time. And every time we run this prompt, we're gonna get something different back. And here's a really cool interactive graphic that you can use to better understand temperature. So first of all, here's a prompt and it's broken down by token. So you can actually see it's color coded by token, which is really cool. The prompt is horses are my favorite and the prompt is going to complete that sentence. And so what it knows right now is it, it is weighting animal at 49.65% confidence that that is the most likely next word to come where animals is a close second with 42.58 and then a new line and an exclamation mark after that. But with the temperature being zero, it's always going to return the top result. So it's always gonna say animal. But when you start adjusting the temperature to 0.5 or even one, it might 
return animals instead. So here, here are a couple examples. Temperature is zero. Horses are my favorite animal four times. Doesn't ever change. However, if the temperature is set to one, we get animal, we get animals, we get an exclamation mark, and then we get animals again. When you know what you want in response from the model, it's good to set the temperature to zero or close to zero. When you want something more creative, if you're asking for a poem, if you're asking for a haiku, anything that takes more creativity, it's good to set the temperature higher. So one last thing I wanna get into before we actually build something is the usage policy. Now, obviously no illegal activity, no harmful material, abuse material, hate, harassing content, this all makes sense, malware. But one thing that I saw that kind of jumped out at me is activity that has a high risk of economic harm. So you can't do anything with multi-level marketing, gambling, payday lending. And it also says you can't determine eligibility of credit, employment, uh, educational institutions or public assistance services using the AI. You also can't have any adult content. So that seems like an obvious one, but dating apps jumped out at me. They actually use the, the word dating app, so you can't actually have an assistant help with the dating app, which I thought was interesting. You can't also generate high volumes of campaign materials for political campaigning or lobbying. So I, that's good. And then one last thing at the bottom here, which is actually really important for things that I want to build is Automated systems must disclose to users that they are interacting with an AI system. So if you build a chatbot, you have to disclose that you are a chatbot. If you have a customer service chatbot, you must say that you're a chatbot. The exception to that is chatbots that depict historical public figures, which that sounds really cool to build. Or if you're clearly labeled simulated or parody, then you don't need to disclose that it's a chatbot. Another thing I wanna show off is the playground. So I'll link this in the description. This is a playground. We're gonna actually be using the chat interface. We'll go with chat. These are actually settings that you can pass through the API. The system is you're basically assigning it a role. So you are a personal shopping assistant. And then the message we want is, what should I wear today? And so this is a system message and this is the actual user message or the prompt. So we can pass that through. Oh, and you can set the temperature here. You can set the max length and a few other settings, but we're gonna stick with a high temperature of one. Click submit. And the assistant says, it depends on the weather, the occasion, your personal style. Can you pl please provide more information about your location, the activities planned for the day and your preferences? It's sunny and I plan on taking a long walk. Hit submit. For a sunny day walk, suggest wearing comfortable clothes. So it gives me a bunch of suggestions. So this is a great way to just play around with it. Um, very similar to the ChatGPT chat interface, but you can actually have a little bit more fine grain control and it's a reflection of the API. Okay, so now that we have a base understanding of the API and some of its limitations, let's actually build something. I'm gonna use Python, although I don't really know Python super well, but we'll try it out anyways. So if you don't have Python installed, you can install it from here. I already installed it, so let's give it a go. And then we wanna clone this repository. So we'll go ahead and we'll copy this. Of course, you can just click here, and then let's clone it. Puts it right there on my desktop. Great, let's CD into it. Now we it says navigate into the project directory and make a copy of the example environment variables file. So let's go ahead, we already did that. And then we're gonna copy the example into an actual environment variable. Then we're gonna create and actually use our API key. So I'm gonna create a new one for this. I'll copy it. Okay, so I opened up the file in Visual Studio Code, and the first thing we need to do is actually open the folder. Let's open up our M file. We're gonna paste the key in where it says open AI API key, save. We'll go back to app.py. And what it's doing is it's importing the OS, it's importing the open AI library, and then we're importing Flask, which will help with the rendering, the redirects, basically anything with the HTTP. We get the open AI instance. Then here on line seven, we set the API key, we set up the routes, and then we set up the index method, which will be a post. And so we'll have a form and the form will submit an animal type. So horse, dog, cat, frog. And what we're gonna get back is a completion, which will be a name for the animal. So we have generate prompt method right here. And if we look here, it says return, suggest three names for an animal that is a superhero. And then it, we have a few shot prompt. So it provides a few examples. 
And then what we want in return is what ChatGPT says the animal name should be. So once we have that, let's come back here and we need to run these. This gets us into Python. Then we're gonna install the requirements. And the last thing we'll do is get Flask going, which will get our server going. And we do have to wait till all this stuff installs. And this takes forever. So go get a cup of coffee, go take a walk. Don't just sit here looking at it like I am. Now, one thing to remember is that the example provided in the API documentation is actually still based on the DaVinci version, so not the Turbo version. In another video, when we actually start building something more substantial than this, we'll use the Turbo API endpoint. And I haven't actually decided what language to use. I am I know Ruby on Rails really, really well, so I'll probably end up using that, but I was also thinking about using a no-code solution like Bubble. So if you have any preferences, drop a comment below. Let me know what language you want me to use with the next project I build. Okay, so it finished. That took a very long time. But next, let's do Flask Run. That'll get our server up and running and we'll be able to actually see the code in action. So let's grab this URL right here, localhost on port 5000, paste it in. And here it is, name my pet, enter an animal. Let's do a bunny. There it is, Super Hopper, Thumper Man, Carrot Crusader. And we see we get all the responses uh, in the logs. Very, very cool. And there you go, that's it. That's as simple as it can get. We put in a type of animal here and it provides three names in re response. We're actually, we're up and running. We have a local environment using Python connected to the OpenAI API, and we essentially have ChatGPT anywhere we want. It's only up to our imagination as engineers what we can do with this. So that's it. Uh, we built our first ChatGPT API implementation. Let me know what you wanna see me build with this API next and what language you want me to build it in. I'm really excited about building stuff with this API. I do truly believe this is the future of technology. So if you like this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.